Okay, good afternoon. My name is Frank Fukuyama. I'm a senior fellow here at Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. I'm the Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to Stanford University. So my center uh, looks at the development of democratic institutions around the world. We're part of a larger uh, institute that's led by Mike McFall. Uh, and uh, we are a research institute. We're interdisciplinary. We have political scientists, economists, sociologists, all uh, working to study policy-relevant issues uh, around the world. Uh, and I think all of us have been not just interested in studying the world, we also you know, hope to change it in terms of uh, thinking about policy and acting uh, in the world. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction to the Ukrainian Emerging uh, Leaders Program. This is a new program for us that just started uh, this fall. Uh, it was actually the brainchild of Katya and Sasha Akimenko. They were at Stanford as part of the JS Knight Fellows Program. This is a, basically a journalism program. They had such a great experience uh, spending the year uh, taking classes and interacting with the community here at Stanford that they said that this would be an important opportunity for other um, mid-career professional uh, Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, to our amazement, they succeeded in raising the money uh, for this program from some very enthusiastic donors, and so we started it uh, this fall. And uh, we are extremely happy to have our first uh, class uh, of emerging leaders. Uh, the, they're sitting uh, off to my uh, left there, so we have Alexander Starodubsev, uh, Dmitry Romanovich, and Alexander Matvichuk. Uh, Alexander was one of the developers of Prozoro, uh, the procurement, open source procurement uh, software. Uh, he's worked in the uh, procurement, uh, procurement office in the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade. Uh, Lesia is a, uh, a human rights defender. Uh, she uh, runs the Center for Civil Liberties and uh, Euromaidan uh, SOS. And uh, Dima is uh, part of the Reform Delivery Office of the uh, Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. So we're extraordinarily pleased to have them with us uh, this year uh, at Stanford. Uh, I'd like to thank the donors that uh, made this program possible. Uh, this, this includes Yaroslava Johnson, who's um, head of the Western NIS um, uh, Enterprise Fund, uh, Thomas Fiala of Dragon Capital, uh, Slava Vakarchuk. I suspect that a lot of you are actually here because of Slava, uh, who will be performing for us later uh, this evening. And then our most uh, recent donor, uh, Rustam Umerov of the um, Astem Foundation, uh, who is an entrepreneur who will actually be uh, locating uh, here to uh, Silicon Valley. So, uh, Rustam, if I could ask you to come up and just say briefly a, a little bit of introduction and welcome. Thank you. I have some notes, not that much experience, so I would uh, be comfortable if I read it. Uh, if we want to change Ukraine, we must start with education. The culture of education must start in families and continue in all levels of school years and emotional literacy. Changes in complex systems begin with simple ones. It is important to organize an ongoing flow of modern education for people who will create a platform for future changes in state affairs. With high standard universities, we may encourage academicians to build market-oriented R&Ds where one can be paid for results rather, uh, rather for existence. During childhood years, we have been told in our families and national ethnic institutions that Crimea is our homeland. Crimea is Ukraine's southern part with beautiful mountains and unique nature on Black Sea. We're so strong in our love to return to Crimea that what started with some family resettlements back in USSR times grew into big return to homeland, a mass after deportation. We were told to be proud who we are, to be educated, and work for what we want to achieve, 
and never ever give up in determination to live in homeland. We settled on small pieces of lands and our communities grew and nothing mattered but our will to resettle home. During school years, care and support of my family and staff made me feel that I studied a most progressive place on earth, even though it was a small village in Crimea. And because of that given support today, I know that hard things are a matter of time, endurance, and hard work. It's my family who helped me throughout my life and taught me values such as sincerity, honor, dignity, respect, justice, and being nearby those who need support. In 91, when there were approximately 255,000 people returned back home to Crimea, we elected 255 delegates for National Assembly called Kurultai. Among them, we elected 33 members, uh, we call it Majlis, and we elected chairman and several deputies. These 33 men, when elected, were, uh, were from different countries, cities, towns, villages, and from different social backgrounds and level of education, but, will, uh, but always were champions in their spheres of expertise and set an example towards community and people of our origin. And we were adding value to stronger national identity. We were kids at that time, but we saw how Majlis, with limited resources, achieved great results for unity of people by surpassing modern challenges and consistent in our values for true citizenship. Kurulta and Mejlis is a great institution and school to me, which proved to be consistent and solid rock during 2014 invasion and continuing to perform great dignity towards injustice and legal occupation. I've traveled a lot with our leaders and most strongest powers they had actually were power of hope, the power of words, the power of one person, the power of leaders, the power of people, support, the power of future. The decision taken by Benjilis and Kurultai to protect Ukrainian unity during occupation with courage became support of 300,000 people in Crimea, then supported by 44 million Ukrainians, and then supported then more than 100 governments, which became world support of Ukraine in its righteousness. We talk a lot about being national in Ukraine, but a person who cannot be universal cannot provide benefits to national interests. Before becoming national, we ought to become universal. We need to learn in frontier horizons. Therefore, Ivy League schools such as Stanford will help us not only educate people in their areas of expertise, but will expand horizons, help to understand the universal trends and add value for people that need hope, especially where the rule of law is still a dream. Thank you. Well, I think I can probably join a lot of people in this room in expressing the hope that Crimea returns to Ukraine uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, so before I invite the uh, panelists up uh, and introduce them, I just want to say a little bit uh, about why Ukraine. I mean, actually, after we started this program, I got requests from Brazil and other countries saying, why not a Brazilian leaders program and so forth. And so there's nothing wrong with Brazil, but I do think that in terms of world politics today, Ukraine really occupies a very central role uh, there was a big expansion uh, of democracy that took place from the 1970s up until the 2000s, in which many countries, new countries, became democratic, including uh, a number of those uh, former communist countries. Uh, but since uh, the mid-2000s, that wave has been reversed, and I think particularly over the past year, we've seen some very disturbing developments with new populist uh, movements uh, arising in many uh, countries around the world. And you have the uh, case of Russia, where you have a country that had been democratic or had been trying to create democratic institutions back in the 1990s revert into a much more uh, overt form of authoritarian uh, government. And uh, as 
all of you are aware, this had big foreign policy implications uh, with the uh, invasion of Crimea and um, Eastern Ukraine, a conflict that has been submerged in the Western media, but is still a very, uh, very live one. Uh, and that conflict, you know, really represents a big conflict of values between countries that seek to be genuine democracies that observe a rule of law uh, and those that are kleptocratic regimes that uh, really don't respect uh, those kinds of limitations on power. And that's important for us Americans because we live in a country of laws, uh, a democratic country of laws, and we uh, need to, we need to live in a world where other countries share uh, our values. And that's why the struggle for Ukraine is very important. Uh, if Ukraine fails in its experiment since Euromaidan uh, in uh, becoming a stable democracy, I think that's going to send a very bad message to not just other countries in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but I think uh, to the world more generally. So when we were thinking, well, what could we do to help this? There's not much that I or anyone here at Stanford can do directly. Uh, what we do is education. We're a school. And I think uh, our natural role is uh, not this short-term one of giving policy advice or trying to fix the politics or do something about corruption in the short run. I mean, these are all problems that Ukrainians ultimately have to solve. Uh, the real uh, thing that we can do is prepare the next generation uh, of people who will hopefully uh, take leadership positions in a new uh, democratic and successful uh, Ukraine in the future. So that's really why we're, uh, why we're doing this today. Um, I would like to also say <laughs> that um, we very much uh, want to cultivate our relationship with the Ukrainian-American community. I'm going to make a, just a frank, uh, a blatant appeal. You know, we want to keep this program running over the longer run. Uh, we have resources uh, for this year to do that, but, you know, we need to continue uh, this fundraising. And so, uh, if anybody here, or and, and by the way, we're live streaming this, so this is also on the internet, and it's going out to a lot of other people. If other people uh, are interested in, you know, helping to support this program, I think um, uh, we would uh, appreciate that very much. So let me now uh, uh, introduce the um, uh, the panelists. Uh, the topic, the general topic, is going to be on U.S.-Ukrainian relations now and into the future. Uh, we're very honored to have His Excellency Valery uh, Charlie, the ambassador uh, of Ukraine to the United States. Uh, he's ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary uh, of Ukraine to the USA since July 2015. He had previously worked as the deputy head of administration of the president uh, of Ukraine, working for Mr. Poroshenko. Uh, earlier, he had uh, had an earlier career as deputy uh, director general uh, of a leading uh, Ukrainian think tank, the Razumkov uh, Center, where he supervised foreign policy, international law, and security. Uh, programs and previously had also been Deputy Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs. Uh, our second uh, panelist is Lena Kozarny. She's the founding partner and chief executive order uh, officer of Horizon Capital uh, and was appointed uh, CEO in December of 2014 after serving as a founding partner and chief financial officer from 2006 as an officer also of the Western NIS uh, Enterprise Fund, one of, our, uh, one of our supporters. She's a member of any number of important economic organizations in Ukraine, the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine, the Ukrainian Venture Capital and Private Equity uh, Association. Uh, she's vice president of the Ukrainian World Congress that represents 20 million Ukrainians uh, in the Ukrainian uh, diaspora. So we're very uh, happy to have her. Uh, and our final panelist is our own uh, Mike McFall. Uh, Mike is a political scientist. He's a member of the uh, political science department here at Stanford University and has been for many years. He's the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute, so he's my boss. And uh, he uh, had a distinguished career in government. He worked on the National uh, Security Council dealing with Russian affairs. He was then uh, made ambassador of the United States uh, to Russia. 
uh, where he served prior to uh, coming back to Stanford as the director uh, of FSI. So if I could invite uh, our panelists to come up on the stage, we'll begin the discussion. Mike, you're over there. Uh, okay, I think you can be there. Mr. Lester. So, um, especially for this audience, I don't think that uh, we need that much of an introduction to why U.S. Ukrainian, U.S. Russian, Ukrainian Russian uh, relations are. Uh, very much in the news and very critical uh, in all of our countries. But uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to begin with you from your vantage point in Washington and also uh, reflecting you know, the views in Kiev. How do you see the current situation and, and the way that the relationship uh, has developed and how it may you know, evolve in the future? First of all, thank you so much you invite me. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and to among such a distinguished panelists and also spoke um, before such a great audience. I find many of my fellow Ukrainians from all over the world. Some of them I met first time for I think, decades. Some of them comes from Ukraine one year ago. So it's a great opportunity and very emotional. Thank you so much that you bring me here. And definitely for our new emerging leaders in the country that you allow to educate Ukrainians, and you made the right decision. I also <laughs> like Brazil, I like Brazil football, <laughs> but you know, you made the right decision, seriously speaking, because, and we appreciate that the Stanford, not only Stanford, like uh, one of the leading center for keeping focus on Ukraine and, and, and Europe. We discussed many times, this was Ambassador McFall here in Stanford, that uh, Europe matters because security in Europe and uh, all the challenges this and threat that's happened now. And uh, result of our activity, Ukrainians, all our partners, friends around the world, that's it could be respond for the challenges and threat 21st century in the world. Uh, and uh, that's why Ukraine important place now, not because we uh, defend our sovereignty against the second military power in the world. Can you imagine? It's, uh, Russia, nuclear power, it's uh, military forces, more than 1,200,000. Ukrainians paid a big price. They killed our 10,000 civilians and killed now 2,879 our soldiers and officers. But we survived. We stopped the second army in the world. And we are Ukrainians. We are not open the full-scale war against aggressor. We are trying to find the solution in diplomatic ways. And uh, now this uh, approach, supported by the United States, supported by our European partners, our partners from Canada to Australia, will demonstrate us, is it possible in the 21st century to find a solution by diplomatic means, or it uh, will be time of wars. Uh, the time that's Korean leader, North Korean leader, will be right. That's nuclear power, the military forces matters, and the main tool. We believe, we Ukrainians, we believe, still believe, that we will release our temporary occupied Crimea with our Crimea Tatars, Ukrainians, with all our friends. We are sure that we released by diplomatic ways, but it's difficult, with Russian negotiation, with support of the United States, as today Secretary of State Rex Tillerson mentioned, no way sanctions will be uh, all the time. This Russia will not implement and not bring, bring back military forces and troops, everything to all territory. So we keep that position, and uh, I believe this we are taking the right approach. But before I share with you some additional, maybe on the equation, additional information where we are now. I want to begin with uh, some facts in Ukrainian history, very recent Ukrainian history. Ukrainians demonstrated new approach and new uh, values on the post-Soviet space. So now it's a competition of two models, Russian lead model and 
Ukrainian-led model in the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm not speaking about Baltic states because now Baltic states belong to the European Union, NATO, not our neighbors in the West, but I mostly speak about Belarus, Moldova, Caucasus, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. Russia, uh, if you compare position of the different countries uh, voting for the resolution on the violation of human rights in Crimea on the same committee two weeks ago, you can find the majority of the countries in the world that support position of Ukraine and small group of the countries leading by Russia, like Venezuela, Syria, uh, North Korea, um, some other country, but important for us, also the former Soviet Union countries, like Belarus, our neighbors. They also support position of Russia. And there's a struggle, this is fighting about the future among not Ukraine and Russia. Yes, it's war. It's real war. We do not name it war because if we name it war and implement all the measures in, inside the country as a war, which is a full-scale conflict. But we compete on the different values. Russia recognized Stalin as a Stalin dictator of the 20th century as a leader. We are recognizing him as a criminal, criminal leader who has uh, killed Ukrainians in Holodomor Holocaust. Sorry, Holodomor genocide. Uh, so we absolutely different, have a different perception in the future strategy how to secure this part of the world. We believe that we need to keep the international standards, sovereignty, territorial integrity. Russia demonstrate another approach. In the 21st century, easily violate everything. Again, the country who give up the second nuclear arsenal in the world, Ukraine. Receive the assurances, receive assurances from the United States, Great Britain, and Russia after the giving up this nuclear potential arsenal. And now we are threatened, and they are just to open aggression against us. Uh, important, which, what's, we are, what's a lesson we learn from this situation? All of us. I mean, not only politicians, but also people in the world. Uh, now, it's a great attention in Ukraine. I once again, appreciate this American leadership in the previous administration leading by Obama, and now leading by President Trump, we keep a focus on Europe. Uh, we discussed this also many times, and my firm position that North Korea is important, Middle East important, but Europe most important. Because World War I, World War II began in Europe, because of millions of people killed in Europe. And if we allow anybody to destroy order security in Europe, it will lead us to catastrophe. So we must stop Russia together, just to show Russia the right direction of development. I'm not speaking about Putin or his very close surrounding. I'm speaking about Russian people. They need new understanding. They need absolutely new approach because the most problem of us, for Ukrainians, not Putin. Putin, we understand how we're doing with Putin, just defend the country. But the problem is we have a big country on our northern borders, not Canada, <laughs> not Canada, <laughs> unfortunately. But we have Russia, and we will have Russia in this territory, and we will have hundreds of millions of Russians. And the most problem with Russian propaganda, Russian control of TV channels, now most of these people support this approach. Most of the Russians support annexation of Crimea. And that's a problem. It's easy to change the US switch of these TV propaganda channels. And uh, 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 according to calculation of Russian analysts, uh, Russia can change people's perception uh, in a very particular issue for one year. We remember that. Ukraine was the most friendly country. Uh, when Russia opened this propaganda preparing for this uh, war, February 4, it was preparing in 2013. For one year, they achieved this Ukraine, not the most uh, unfriendly country, but second one. The most, as usually United States, keeping the leading position in Russia, we are second one. And Georgia now in the third place. So that's the most problem for us, how we will live in the 21st century in the peace. And uh, our relationship with the United States help us a lot because uh, it's a strong bipartisan position in the United States, support Ukraine against Russian aggression. Uh, we have uh, absolutely support from Pentagon and uh, demonstration of uh, that is the participation of uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis in uh, Ukraine, in Kiev, and the 
part of Kiev in parade, uh, shoulder to shoulder with, uh, with uh, soldiers from uh, US Army. And today, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is a delegation from National Guard of California goes to Kiev mm -hmm. to continue a train and equip program for Ukrainian Army, National Guard and Ukrainian Army. We have in the Congress uh, decision in the Senate now, 350 million US dollars support for uh, military equipment for next year for Ukraine, and I believe it will be signed by President Trump. Uh, we have a good relation on the high and highest level. We had the two meetings uh, now, delegation leading by our presidents. We discussed many issues. We have a very good uh, results in our economic projects. We are closest never before with Americans. Uh, it's easy for us now to discuss the geopolitical issue, geopolitical issue with Americans than with Russians. Despite of our long time common uh, neighborhood. So that's a change everything. That's a change mind, change mentality, change uh, perceptions. And that's a very challengeable time. That is a great time of opportunities. Ukrainians, young Ukrainians, new leaders in Ukraine demonstrate at a great potential, not the largest territory in Europe, not the potential for our army. Now, from the zero, now it uh, grows from the top 10 armies in Europe, efficient army in Europe. But the people, people and young generation in Ukraine going through Maidan, Orange Revolution, but more important, professionals, young professionals. And uh, that's the real potential of my country. And uh, believe me, when I met with Boyan, who met with Facebook, when we increase for 500 jobs in Ukraine in Kiev Polytechnical Institute, for Facebook, 1,000 jobs, Some, sometimes I think how many young professionals we have in Ukraine, because we give it that to the United States, to Great Britain, Canada, and other countries, <laughs> and still we have such a potential. And uh, that uh, makes me optimist in this situation. Our people. And uh, frankly, without United States, without your firm position, without so support of American people, this uh, continuous and humanitarian assistance, I see many people here, Americans, and Ukrainian origin American, who is a sent humanitarian assistance to Ukrainians. Ukrainians. And uh, with such sympathy and such assistance, it would be impossible to, like, not because we are not ready to defend the country, we are ready. We are all 45 million ready to defend our country because our families, our homes. But you know, in, your enthusiasm, support in Ukraine, make us motivated to fight against anybody who just violate international order, to destroy non-proliferation system, to destroy the system of Helsinki system. So we are ready to be on this front line. But still, we count on your support. And your professor just mentioned if Ukraine will lose now. When Ukraine will win, we will win together. Slava Ukraine. <laughs> so, Lena, you've been a longtime investor in Ukraine um, and in the region. So, uh, I think everything really depends on whether there's going to be strong economic growth. So, can you say a little bit about your sense of the prospects for that happening? Um, Thank you. <clears throat> so, first of all, I want to say it's a real honor for me to be here today. And I wear two hats today. I wear CEO of Horizon Capital, but also Vice President of Western NS Enterprise Fund. And um, weaving it back, I'll, I'll speak about the economy, but first I want to set a little bit about the context uh, in terms of U.S.-Ukraine, the impact that uh, this fund has had, which, of course, was seeded by the U.S. government uh, many years ago. And I'm talking about, of course, Western Mass Enterprise Fund, which is where, for me, it began and for many others. Um, but this was one of 10 enterprise funds that was set up by US Congress. This was 150 million for Ukraine, um, Moldova, and Belarus. And when we look at the impact that Western Mass has had over all of these years, it's approaching 25 years. Um, <clears throat> but Western NS has has directly invested 168 million, um, has helped to launch Horizon Capital, which I'm proud to lead. 
and Horizon, we've gone on to raise, you know, another over six hundred and fifty million dollars. Um, and all told, it's forty-five thousand jobs. It's you know almost six hundred million dollars invested in Ukraine, in one hundred and forty companies. I mean, that that's a really big, uh, large body of work, and definitely that has the roots with the U.S. and you know myself with with our new fund that has been launched that again has been backed by U.S. government and other governments as well as private investors, um, it's essential because economic prosperity is a national security issue. So by and large, I think everybody agrees that for Ukraine to be successful, ultimately, the country needs to be economically strong and economically prosperous. And where we see those opportunities are by the young generation. I mean, that, that is what is changing the face of Ukraine. And, and looking from our vantage point, um, we back visionary entrepreneurs. Visionary entrepreneurs, which is you know, entrepreneurs in IT, in light manufacturing, in food and agro. And these are typically people who, who were not born in the Soviet Union, who grew up, um, who don't remember the Soviet Union, who are playing by different rules, and who want to be part of global communities. Um, so what we're seeing, that, that economic revival, and there is an economic revival. You know, I, I travel the world, I meet with our investors, I meet with new investors, and I'm often greeted with, you know, don't talk to me about Ukraine, war and corruption. And, and that is not Ukraine's story. Um, there is so much more that's happening in Ukraine. And if we look at what the cost of as Ambassador so, so rightfully spoke about the, the, the very difficult times that Ukraine has faced, the annexation of Crimea, um, the eastern, uh, the war in Donbass, I mean, that has had an enormous economic cost to the country. And I believe an economic cost that many believe that Ukraine could not recover from. I mean, I, I'm not sure how many countries would be able to recover from six weeks of import cover, $5 billion in reserves, or having less than $150,000 in the treasury account. I don't know how many countries could deal with 43% inflation or 70% devaluation of their currency. I mean, it, it's an it's enormous achievement what has happened in the last three years. And I, I, I get personally upset when I hear people say there's no reforms or what has happened or Ukraine has not done enough. Um, I believe that that's an insult to all of the people who left business and, and other, um, other fields to go into the government at every branch, whether parliament, legislative, of course, executive, um, throughout civic society. So I believe in the last three years, we, we finally we have seen an enormous amount of reforms. I'm not going to go through all of them. You know, you know, we can talk about that later. Um, but more has been done, and I've lived in Ukraine for 24 years. More has been done in the last three years than in all of the years before them. That's for sure. And in terms of economically, what we're seeing, we saw the inflection point in quarter two, 2015. Every single quarter, GDP growth increases. Um, and if you look at it, and no one's too impressed with 2 to 3% GDP growth. But if you look at the underlying figures, again, just as war and corruption is not the story, Two to three percent is not the story. Look at individual sectors. While we've seen a 16 percent drop in the financial sector, we've seen a 16 percent year-on-year increase in construction. We've seen six percent in IT. We've seen over six percent in food and agro. That's the story, but people don't talk about that. Um, I think it's also, you know, what's important for our investors is when we we compare Ukraine against other countries. I mean, they're used to emerging economies like Brazil, like Argentina, um, that they've invested in. When I show them a graph that shows in doing business World Bank rankings that we now exceed, we've gone from below Brazil, Argentina, and India, and we now exceed them in the global business rankings, you know, they're astounded. Or if I talk to them about Global Innovation Index, which is driven by the IT professionals, and we're ahead of India, Brazil, and Argentina, and we were below them four years ago. 
So these are amazing gains that are not the efforts of one person or someone in government. It's a collective effort driven by the new generation and by, by business heroes, um, not just uh, leaders that we see throughout the government, but leaders that we see in business who are really paving a path and, and driving this economic recovery. So I'm, you know, what are we investing in? You know, we've invested since Maidan, we've invested $60 million. We'll invest another 100 to 200 million in the next year and a half to two years. We continue to invest and we're backing particularly new generation and small and medium sized businesses. Thank you. Well, thank you. So Mike, lots been going on in Washington. Uh, by the way, uh, it's not hard to get Mike's opinion on a lot of things. All you have to do is follow him at, at McFall on Twitter and you'll get a Yes. running commentary on a lot of current events, but uh, you know, uh, you're a particular expert on Russia and uh, that's been a very problematic relationship, so how do you see you know, the evolution of it? Um, Thanks, Frank. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for everybody for being here. Uh, I think this is a fantastic pro uh, project. Uh, I'm very proud that Stanford is one of the leaders in America on all things Ukrainian now, um, um, and that we have so many people here and our guests today, I think is a testimony to that. I do want to say I follow uh, U.S.-Ukraine relations pretty closely. I follow U.S.-Russia relations not quite as closely, but pr pr fairly closely, and I do think it is rather impressive how you have managed the transition from my former administration to the Trump administration, and there is a great deal of consensus about Ukraine. There's one guy at the top who I'm not quite sure of, uh, but everybody else, I think, uh, the way you've nurtured the, the yeah, and he happens to be the president, uh, but aside from him, uh, uh, I think it's quite remarkable how that consensus have, has uh, stayed together. So I appreciate the efforts that both of you have done, actually, on the, on the economic story, too. We'll come back to that in a minute, but that is a, that is a public relations fight, and I'm glad you're, you're fighting it. Um, my assignment was to talk about Russia. Uh, and, and what I thought I would do, although with Ambassador Charlie here, I don't, usually I can say this. I can say, how many people have hung out and drank tea and vodka with Putin and nobody can raise their hand? We're a little bit different today because of Ambassador Charlie's uh, presence on the, the podium here. But I've spent some time with Putin. Uh, he doesn't like me. Um, in fact, uh, I can no longer travel to Russia. I'm on the, the sanctions list. Uh, the last UN ba U.S. ambassador to be on that sanctions list was a guy named George Kennan. Uh, so I have a particular... No, 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 no. I, I, uh, that, that was not meant as an applause line. Uh, that's just a historic fact. Um, but I want to say I have some biases about Putin, and I'm going to tell you uh, some of the things I think about him. But I, what I wanted to do was tell you a little bit about the way I think he thinks about Ukraine, because I've, I've had the chance to listen to him speak about Ukraine. I actually met him the first time in the spring of 1991. So I've been uh, following his career for a long time and uh, in the government, uh, dealt with him uh, uh, up close and personal for a while. So I want to tell you what uh, five things he thinks about Ukraine. And therefore, that gives us five, maybe six lessons that we in the West, and I deliberately say we in the West, have to do uh, in order to push back on his thinking. All right? Here's my five things that Putin thinks about Ukraine. First thing, my source is not myself, but is actually our colleague here, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, Condi just wrote a new book on democracy. She has a chapter on Ukraine. And the title of that chapter uh, is called, quote, Ukraine is a made-up country. And she's quoting Vladimir Putin. That's what Putin told George W. Bush in 2008. Your country, in his view, doesn't, should not exist. First thing you need to know about Putin. He doesn't think Ukraine should exist as a country. Second, Ukrainians, or for that matter, any small-D democratic forces uh, around the world do not act on their own. They, always is a hidden hand behind that activity. And that hidden hand is almost always the United States and the CIA in particular. I've heard him talk about Syria. I've heard him talk about Ukraine. I've heard him talk about uh, Egypt. I've heard him talk about Tunisia. 
and I've heard him talk about Russia in those terms. People don't act on their own. That's not, a, that's not possible. There has to be some hidden hand behind it because people cannot, by definition, act on their own, including Ukrainians. Third, Putin is incredibly cynical. He's incredibly cynical about ideas. He's incredibly cynical about words like democracy. Uh, he believes that, that basically all political systems in the world are the same. Uh, unas uvas, you know, this idea, you Americans versus us, you, you Ukrainians versus Russians, we're all the same. There's no real facts. Uh, every truth is relative. And, and, and therefore, he hears everything through that very cynical uh, lens that he brings to everything. Fourth, every person has a price. Putin believes this to his soul. Everybody can be bought. There's nobody that is beyond uh, the right deal. Fifth, the West will lose interest in Ukraine because the West has a very short attention span, whereas he will never forget about Ukraine. He and Russia, and I'm glad you put out Russians as well as Putin, uh, but I'm talking about Putin here, uh, will never forget about the way he defines his interests vis-a-vis your country. And he believes firmly that time is on his side. By the way, he's a young man who works out three hours a day. Uh, he's playing for the long haul. He, want, he, will, he thinks that time is on his side with respect to Ukraine. So what does that mean for the West, for Ukrainians, for Americans, and I would say the Western liberal order in particular, and how to deal with Putin's impact on Ukraine and Putin's impact on U.S.-Ukrainian relations? First, and I'm just going in reverse order here. You already said it, Ambassador, but I want to reaffirm it. Ukraine has to fight for its sovereignty. Uh, literally, you've done that, not, not figuratively. But that will be a fight. That will not be given to you. You'll have to fight for your sovereignty as long as Putin is the leader in Russia. Two, Ukraine, Ukrainians, and hopefully with our assistance, uh, must deepen democracy. There's no greater threat to Putin and his system of government and his way of ruling than a successful democracy on his border. He has an argument, if you follow him closely, as I do, that, you know, at the end of the day, Slavic people, and he uses that word on purpose, they like strong hands. There's a cultural, historic reason why he needs to be the leader of Russia for decades. He makes that argument. Privately, I've heard him make it even in stronger terms, but publicly he makes it too. He's not afraid to make that argument. What is the greatest challenge to that? Ukraine becoming a liberal democracy firmly embedded in the West. That's what he fears, and that's why we have to fight for that. Third, facts matter. Truth matters. There is a right and a wrong. If we stop fighting for that, Putin wins. Fourth, we have to refute the idea that every person has a price. The rule of law matters. Fighting corruption matters. I agree with your point that I think this, this gets uh, to your common, you know, when I travel to Washington, you know, the first thing that comes up is corruption, corruption, corruption. That is the, not the right story. But it is also the story that there is corruption in Ukraine uh, and that it is a patriotic duty of Ukrainians to fight it, in my view. And it is the, in America's national interest uh, to fight that because that is not a fight just against some abstract thing called corruption. That is a fight against Putin's system of rule. Fifth, we in the West have to realize the historic moment. Actually, uh, Frank already said it very eloquently. But as I look out at the world and I think of the greatest security challenge and the greatest challenge to democracy, the epicenter, the moment, the focal point of that fight in the world today is Ukraine. I think we will look back, historians will look back right now on this moment. And this will be the moment when we decide where Europe is, when we decide about Russian imperialism or not. It's right now. There are some competitors, right? We can talk about North Korea. Uh, maybe we can talk about Tunisia, although I don't think Tunisia compares in terms of uh, the importance for the fight of democracy. And 
We in the West have to remember that. I, I fear that, but Putin may be right, that we forget about it. We got all of our problems at home. We got problems around the world. I think we need to keep the focus on this critical moment, and that's why I'm really uh, thrilled that we have this program here at Stanford. And then finally, to Ukrainians and Ukrainian Americans involved in this fight. I want you to realize your incredible luck. I want to say that again. How lucky you are to be born Ukrainian. Because you have a fantastic opportunity to make history on a world scale. Most of us don't get that chance. Most of us just, you know, we sit around and, and watch and write about other people making history. You have the chance to make it right now. It, that's your, that is your incredible fate. You're really lucky to be the ambassador uh, to, to the United I know. States. It's incredible. <laughs> I, it wasn't so lucky to be the US ambassador to Russia when I was there. Uh, but it is an incredible moment to be at this incredible moment in the history of Ukraine. So seize that opportunity. Don't blow it. Realize how fortunate you are to be part of a most, I think, what the most important moment in Ukrainian history, and by in, in implication, European history and in the history of the Western world. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, Mike, I'm, I'm glad you think that Putin is a young man because he's about my age. And that, <laughs> yeah, means, well, that means that I, I'm a I young man, too. I think you're a young man. <laughs> but I don't, I, don't, I don't work out three hours a day. So maybe he's got some uh, advantages over me. So, Mr. Ambassador, uh, we're here in the middle of Silicon Valley. Uh, and as you pointed out, there's lots and lots of Ukrainians in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's interesting over the past, just the past few months, how the public perception of technology and the internet and social media has dramatically shifted from being almost completely positive to people realizing that there's some real downsides to it, that it can be weaponized uh, and used against uh, democracy. Ukraine is one of the first targets of that weaponization. So your country has been dealing with this issue for you know, a number of years now, whereas I think a lot of people in Europe and the United States have only recently uh, woken up to it. So I'm wondering whether you have any advice on how to deal with this or any reflections on Ukraine's experience that you know other democracies could share. Thank you for your question because initially I think you are going to remind me of GDP of this uh, territory and Ukrainian GDP comparison, how potential we have for growth. Uh, I recognize this is an impressive achievement here. But you are right, there are some uh, assurances uh, in Ukraine because of we have faced such as threats and challenges, including this uh, propaganda, information, uh, fakes, everything. Believe me, even me in the position of ambassador, I'm afraid this problem. And many things happen, uh, now much better, but uh, from the very beginning it was, uh, I, I feel it by myself how this works in Washington. And my first advice, please take this seriously, because it's not only about Ukraine, it's about United States, not only about Europe. Now, as in the Congress, I know from my discussion with congressmen, senators, it's very seriously taken, and new piece of legislation, including how to stop fakes, how to counter propaganda measures implemented, so this is now works. But it's a very, the, my first advice, doing this at the right time, because, uh, the good things from uh, any administration in the United States is the right decision, but bad things is the right decision taken was, uh, I don't know, later, well, one year or two years later, this is, should be implemented. The second piece of advice is uh, now a success of Stop Fake program and other programs and our, uh, projects. Uh, you know, mm, you we just mentioned Putin, young man and other things. Uh, if you want to respond to real challenge and threat, you should to analyze the worst scenario, bad scenarios, all scenarios. By the way, I'm not, uh, except Putin like you. Uh, if you allow me, uh, my first experience was in Crimea when I was Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, welcome Putin as Prime Minister, the mm. meeting of CIS Prime Ministers. Is that right? Yeah. What year and was that? 
It was in, in, uh, it was in 2009, and it was in Crimea. And, uh, you know, when I told Putin when he came from a uh, flight, uh, this welcome in Ukrainian soil, he was just make a step back. Uh, because this was for the first time in history of Ukraine that anybody welcomed him in Crimea and his Ukrainian territory. Wow. That's, so it's not only about Putin, it's about many other factors. And, but about Putin, he's a very old man because he's a <laughs> Soviet, he's a Soviet origin. His yeah. roots very deep in Soviet conservative view. He's a reject any innovation. Don't trust him that he take his uh, Medvedev, Putin, take this mobile phone, cell phone, and say, oh, it's good, by the way, Chinese cell phone. But <laughs> they don't like that. They want to conservate the situation. It's a different of us as we try to develop uh, the country and uh, be closer to the innovation. So back to this story. They all knew our experience. We are faced this not now, not in the 2014 with the uh, temporary annexation of Crimea. It was early. I remember election, Ukrainian election, and interference of Russia in our election. I was in 2004, and so-called Orange Revolution. I was uh, in this team who was stand on Maidan, who was in the first night. And I remember how it was difficult, because all these fakes comes. I, I can share with you my own experience, because this real facts is true. In 2004, an election in Donetsk region, I just uh, I want to explain what has happened now, why Putin can use the situation in Donetsk. It was the calculation, as Stalin mentioned. It doesn't matter who is a vote, it's matter who is calcul how is calculate this result. In the on the night, the criminals from Russia secure this area when they calculate these votes, bulletins, and it was real interference in our internal affairs by Russian criminals. And unfortunately, it was not go the right response in this period. And how we uh, try to fight with these fakes? We are, in that time, we are the group of non-government organization in Ukraine. We are organized, we are make uh, um, our social pool, and we are print, if I'm not mistaken, seven, 75,000 copies in the night, and bring in the main streets of Kiev, and two or three days we keep all the crowd, all the people, because we are give the truth for them. So sometimes important respond immediately, to try to react immediately, not waiting for a long time. And uh, another advice, not advice, but just our experience, uh, still uh, social networks important, but in all particular count countries important TV channels. Uh, believe me, I think this Ukrainian TV channel is difficult to see, but in the United States, not easy also to see <laughs> <laughs> TV channels. Because it, it, it was about politics, for example. So if you want to find the truth, you should to see CNN, Fox, MSNBC, everything. But finally, uh, comments on this, comments, comments on the comments. And what I find also, just share with you my piece of advice. Sometimes your newspapers, uh, frankly, pop, might make a fake news. I couldn't agree with Trump, but he may uh, name everybody fake news, CNN make fake no. But I, with my experience, can say you, sometimes your newspapers make these things. Sometimes we can find journalists, so-called journalists. It's not a journalist, because you have a big trust for your newspapers. And this journalist from Moscow, from Moscow Bureau, this journalist was a very, uh, ex uh, you know, very experienced dealing with uh, this part of the world. So uh, many things you, you should take them seriously and analyze. If you see the news, you should analyze who is a publisher of this news, who is the author of this news, who is a, a quote in this news, and very easily check one of these facts. And you understand, if you check one fact, this is not true, then please don't trust the rest of this material. And finally, uh, it's, it, it, now it's not the final story yet. Now this information attacks, propaganda, is a so-called hybrid weapon is developing. 
And uh, we will face in the very next years uh, absolutely new technology. And that's the most problem that we are not prepared for the response of that. Mm -hmm. So we are not prepared because our minds are not prepared for that. We are living in the era of TV channels. We are living in the era of movies. We are not prepared for, we, okay, we are used social networks, but who is the check, is it true or not in the social network? So we, you know these problems. But no, uh, we, we need systematic response. We need to uh, create in the international law, I am a specialist in international law, believe me, uh, we have the, such a lagoons, because lagoons in that uh, sphere in international law. So many problems, and uh, frankly, I'm not a specialist in that, but as ambassador, I know how important for mm -hmm. all of us find the real tools to response of these threats. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that we're actually uh, studying quite intensely here you know, at FSI. Uh, we have a couple of new projects uh, and working with the companies, you know, because I think they're going to be part of the solution as well. It's not just a government response. So Lena, uh, you know, you were talking about a number of successful reforms. I think one of the most impressive was what happened in the Ukrainian gas market over the last couple of years, where prices were liberalized. That had been such a source of corruption, dependence on, you know, Russian gas. Uh, a lot of that has really just gone away. But the consequence has been that everybody's gas bill has gone up, you know, tremendously, and that can become a populist political issue. So. I wonder if you could talk about the politics of this kind of reform, that do you think this is a, it's in danger of feeding a kind of populism? What's still on the agenda that needs to be done that may be painful, that may be upsetting to people, but you know, still would be necessary to push ahead with? Sure. Um, in terms of energy reform, you, I agree. I think that that has been one of the most successful reforms, and not only because of the liberalization of the of the tariffs, um, but first and foremost, I mean that was that was an area of incredible corruption. I mean that was a hole of ten billion dollars, and everyone knows now that that hole has been closed. Um, that Nafta has has contributed over a billion dollars uh, to the budget in terms of dividend payments. So it's gone from a huge loss to a surplus position. Um, we haven't bought Russian gas for two and a half years now. Uh, with no plans to buy Russian gas. Uh, in terms of the, the tariffs increase, I mean, 11 times tariff increase. If you had those kinds of tariff increases in, in most Western countries, people would be out, out in the streets in a big way. Um, in Ukraine, what happened? What happened was consumption decreased significantly. And for, for the first time, whether it's businesses or consumers you know, or households, you saw people really think about energy conservation. And there were lots of programs in terms of changing windows and, and making changes at household and, and business level to reduce the gas bill. Um, but going to your, your point about populism, that is a threat, especially as we head into 2019. I mean, the, the, the cycle is starting in terms of the politics in Ukraine. Uh, I believe that it's it's enormous. It's very important to stay unified. I mean, it's it, you know, as Ambassador Charlie said. I mean, we and and Ambassador Fall as well. Um, Ukraine did withstand the 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 Russian aggression militarily. Um, now the rhetoric has shifted to Ukraine is a failed state. You know, Ukraine can't govern itself. Look at the corruption. Look at look at all these problems. Uh, things aren't happening fast enough. Um, there needs to be a greater PR effort. There needs to be greater communication about the successes. Um, we're, st we're starting to see that across the, the board. Um, but even if you look at what has happened in the last three or four months, you know, pension reform, the health care reform, education reform, people can talk about what they don't like in those reforms, but by and large, I mean, they are, they are groundbreaking. These are you know, very deep structural reforms, and Ukraine was able to pass this in, in a matter of three months. I mean, that's, that's, that's unheard of. Um, the privatization law that was just passed, the, the law um, limiting the powers of enforcement agencies. I think, by and large, what we see in terms of the, both the business community and, and also um, Ukrainian citizens is, is clearly 
we are having a national dialogue on corruption. You know, clearly we have had institutions that have been launched that relate to the, the prevention, um, um, prosecution, and, uh, and of course the, um, uh, you know, the enforcement uh, bodies. But that is something that is very important. Um, what people don't know, though, it's, it's interesting to me, because everybody knows about you know, over 100,000 public officials who, who submit electronic declarations and, and have started this baseline, which doesn't exist in most countries in the world, um, that have started this baseline in terms of their assets and in terms of public disclosure. Okay, that's, that's incredibly important because that also forms a volume of information for Ukrainian citizens, not just today, but many years to come. Um, but what people don't, don't really follow is that you know, when you look at, at the number of actually prosecutions and, and what's happening right now, I mean, there's over 400 cases that have been opened against top officials. If you look at how many indictments, I mean, it's over 90 indictments. You know, how many people have gone to jail? 24. And, and clearly, Ukraine does have a lot to do, has a, has a lot to, to do in the future in terms of corruption. But when we look at other models, we look at Romania, it took 10 years before they started putting public officials in jail en masse, okay? 1,250, including a sitting prime minister in the last two years. Um, Ukraine is not there yet, but Ukraine only launched in, its institutions two years ago. So I think definitely the efforts and focus are on anti-corruption. All of the talk right now is about the anti-corruption court and that's being discussed right. and, and, and decided. And I think that's ultimately what Ukrainians want to see is, is see that culmination of what was started. Institutions were launched. Let's see that people actually are put in jail for corruption crimes. Um, but that's the, you know, my, my take on, on the corruption side. Um, but by and large, I think what we have for business, for the economy, is there already. Mm -hmm. And privatization law will be passed. Concession law, we also see by the end of the year, which should unlock very large scale infrastructure projects. Decentralization, I mean, there's so many reforms that people don't talk about. <coughs> I mean, taking social payments and cutting it in half. I mean, that's been an incredible boost in terms of tax revenue and also in terms of deshadowing the economy to a large extent. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's, there's, yes, there's much to do, but much has already been done, and we're seeing those effects now. And even if you, if you see, I mean, I'm on the board of AmCHEM, I'm also on the Ukrainian World Congress board, and I'll talk about that for a minute. Um, but in terms of business, by and large, business, you know, look at the, the, the latest investment attractiveness indices. They're the highest that they've been since quarter one, 2013. For EBA, the highest since 2011. That's from people and who are investing in Ukraine today, not looking at it from the outside, but investing today. Um, you have very large investment projects that have gone forward. And one other point I wanna make about decentralization, because that is actually extremely important and an important reform that was put in place. I mean, everybody knows that by and large, the tax revenues were controlled centrally through Kyiv. Now you've got at least 50% of the revenues that are left in the towns and villages for the councils to decide how that money is spent. I mean, what does that mean? That means sewage treatment play, uh, uh, plants, water treatment, I mean, infrastructure, roads that you're seeing at, at the town and village level that we never saw before. I mean, these are, you know, if you look at budgets at that, those levels, they've, they've um, increased 110% in two years. That's an enormous amount at that level. And you can start, you can see that in the villages and towns and cities, you can start seeing the, the roads and, and other projects that have been launched. So, I mean, again, that's not a story that does get out, but it's very important. Um, one, one thing I do wanna mention, because you mentioned Ukrainian Americans and, and you did as well, um, being on the board of Ukrainian World Congress, we have always focused on humanitarian, and it has always been about you know, education, about preserving Ukrainian language, about humanitarian. And this year, actually, we launched a new committee, extremely important, 
um, called Support for Ukraine's Economic Development, because Ukrainian World Congress does see that economy is a national security issue. And I'm, I'm delighted, you know, that last time we had a, a, a meeting in Kiev, we talked about that it's not, you know, only 45 million Ukrainians in Ukraine, but, you know, president and across the board refer to 60 million Ukrainians, because it's over 60 million when you include the entire diaspora, who is extremely supportive of Ukraine. So I think you're going to start seeing a move by Ukrainian diaspora, not just, you know, humanitarian, but focused on the economy, focused on investing, focused on promoting Ukrainian exports, focused on trade relationships, on chambers of commerce, on doing a lot more in terms of business with Ukraine. Good. Well, I hope Ukrainians also move back to Ukraine and actually bring those experiences and talents that the ambassador was uh, suggesting. That's really, I think, critical. Yeah, one They're doing minute that. just to, to add something just, uh, I'm just made. My uh, take, you know, uh, during a lot of time on analysis like uh, in think tank, how to overcome corruption, shadow economy. And I see another tool. If we bring new business in Ukraine, American business, and uh, we have a great tool, fight corruption. Not only a low prosecutor system, it's the system now created. And you mentioned very important decision on anti-corruption court. But not less important, the type of business that we have. Our idea as ambassador, our amb embassy, we, I, I can share with you everything now, but believe me, next year will be breakthrough. You will see that. Because new company, big American company comes to Ukraine. I know that because it's a agreement exists. It's not public yet. I can, okay, I can say you, Greenbrier. <laughs> Greenbrier is a company that is coming our infrastructure that take 15% of this market. And believe me, it will be impossible to rent this uh, Keros, uh, how his name is, Railways Keros, for mm -hmm. corruption. Absolutely impossible. Because Greenbrier have now all the agreements with Cargill, with all the agricultural companies, American. It's one idea. Another idea is to bring the companies of our energy sector. We also have a very good decision, and you will see that next year. Even more, for the first time in our history, American company comes to our aircraft building in Kharkiv. This has never happened before. That's a message for me. That's uh, American company see strategy. I'm not sure about all of us what we see, but American business see strategy in this part of the world. And see Ukraine like a very good place for investment. And by the way, we increased to Nova this year up to the, not year, but seven months, 1.9 times with the United States. And uh, we significantly uh, increase our economic cooperation this year. And I believe next year we will double that. And that's not because uh, Putin or not Putin, no. It's because we are describe our relationship, the, the importance itself, this relationship, economic relationship between U US and Ukraine. And uh, this is one of the important, I agree completely with you, one of the important direction of this we should develop and facilitate this. Good. Mike, uh, just to wrap up, what um, you didn't say, what's Putin's end game in this? I mean, does he just keep these conflicts going indefinitely and hope that someone will get tired uh, eventually? Or does he escalate? Or you know, can you imagine a situation where you actually like, like to settle one of them? Or, settle the situation in eastern Ukraine? Well, I don't think he has an end game. I think he's satisfied with the status quo. But I'm always an optimist, so uh, I'm always looking for some possibility that things are changing. Um, you know, the current negotiations, I used to work with Mr. Surkov, if you know him. Uh, he and I worked with is a strong word. Uh, we used to meet a lot, um, uh, uh, and, and so the, that he is the interlocutor. I, I'd, I'd appreciate what the ambassador might want to say about this on this new, uh, that we're going to work with them uh, to solve this. I'm very skeptical of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our, I know Kurt Volker, the special representative, uh, who's his interlocutor. 
I think Kurt's a fantastic choice, and, and uh, I, I think uh, he understands the problem well. I also give him very uh, low probability of success um, uh, in that job because of, well, A, because I'm not yet convinced that the president, our president, uh, wants to be engaged, and second, I don't think Putin thinks he needs to be engaged. Uh, I don't think anything will change until the presidential election in Russia. Uh, but after that, that could be a moment of opportunity. And, and really, I do think it depends on the, the, the trajectory inside Ukraine. I think if it looks like uh, things are moving in the direction that our two guests have been talking about, uh, pressure for cutting his losses will grow. Uh, but the, the opposite is equally true. If it, if it looks like things stall, if there's fighting, uh, you know, there's no consensus uh, in terms of political populists are arising. We don't need to name names, but but she has taken a new view. Uh, somebody I know well uh, in terms of what she's talking about, and uh, you know, the, uh, one of your leading politicians. I'm talking about Timoshenko, of course. Uh, she's promised that she can solve all these uh, pro problems in terms of populism, but she can also solve the problem with Putin. Well, that creates the uh, hope in Moscow that maybe things could change inside Ukraine that to give them opportunity. So I think our assignment is to to shut that down and to say to to just keep the trajectory moving in the right way that reduces the probabilities that that or the opportunities for Putin to play uh, in nefarious ways inside Ukraine. Yeah, uh, we had actually invited Kurt Volker to speak here on this panel. He gave his regrets. He said that he really had wanted to, but. He's involved in this negotiation right now, so right. He's, a, he's a busy man. Good. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to open uh, the floor up for discussion. Uh, I want to also invite, we have an online audience, so if anyone online wants to submit a question, uh, I believe there should be a, uh, an email uh, address for you to do that. Uh, so if you could raise your hand and then uh, just identify yourself briefly and wait for the microphone. Yes. Hi, my name is Slava. I hope you know me. I have a question. I have many questions, but uh, most interesting I have to Ambassador McFall. Uh, so it will be the question consists of two parts. Uh, they are like twin questions. Uh, so the, the number one will be fantastic. The number two will be probably more challenging than fantastic. If you were uh, the president of Russia, uh, what would you do first? regarding to Ukraine? What would be your priority in Ukraine's policy? If I was? Yeah, if you were. <laughs> well, uh, it's the first part of the question. That's easy. That, that's, that's easy. Well, that, that would be obvious. I, I, I've said this many times. Uh, Putin could end the conflict in, in Ukraine in exactly 30 seconds. He could go on TV, and he could say, we're done. Uh, now, that's what I would do. Uh, and, and by the way, there are some Russians that would do that too. I want to remind you, in the same way that, that the, 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 the corruption, corruption, corruption story doesn't capture the complexity of Ukraine, when I talk to, to, on television, right, and, and, and when people are at who don't follow the story, I want to remind you all uh, that Russia is, is a much more complex society than just Putin. Uh, and there are, there are many Russians. Most of them have their heads down, but I know them personally, that want Ukraine to succeed. Because they see this as a giant loser. Like if, if, if some very senior people in the, I just realized we're online, so I want to be careful here. Uh, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But if, if your job is, is to grow the Russian economy, what, what would be like some really stupid things to do in 2014? The first thing you would do would be to annex Crimea. And then the second thing you would do would be to do whatever you want to call this operation. Ambassador, you, you, I never know quite how to describe the Russian operation in uh, the Donbass. Uh, it's too, war. war is a good word. How about war? Uh, that, that makes no sense at a time that you just spent 18 years fighting to get Russia into the WTO. You just spent uh, you know, uh, billions and billions of dollars to, to come to the Silicon Valley. In this, not on this stage, but just 500 meters from here, President Medvedev came in 2010 to say, we're different. Come to us. 
We're going to build our own Silicon Valley. We're, and they invested lots of money into that. If you're wanting to do that, you just flushed it all down the toilet with that operation, with that war, right? So from just a rational point of view, that makes no sense to a lot of Russians. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, your success, I think, is also uh, part of the long-term success. It'll be a generational change. Uh, I think it's very important to remind, as Ambassador Charlie did, that, that uh, Putin spent most of his formative years in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But most Russians have not. Uh, and, and so that would be what I would do. But of course, I'm not president of Russia. Thank you. And the, the, <laughs> thank you. And the second okay. part of the, I, I told you, were twin, twin questions. So what will be the first thing you do about Ukraine if you are elected the president of the United States? Uh, I thought you were going to ask me if I was elected president of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Then I was going to ask That's you. No. Yeah. Uh, um, the second will be not that fantastic, more challenging. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm, I'm remembering some of the mistakes we made over our history, right? Um, and we did make some mistakes. Actually, I'm writing a book about it right now. I just finished my Ukraine chapter. That's why I was asking you the questions about Minsk, because I was finishing my Minsk chapter just yesterday. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we could go back and talk about that, but it, you, you asked a futuristic question. Um, you know, it, it gets to my last point. My biggest worry about Ukraine policy is that we lose interest. I, I, you, we can debate about what, I, you know, I think President Obama was slow and the administration was slow to react to the annexation of Crimea. I, I'd left the government by then, so it's easy for me to say. Uh, I know those interagency fights about sanctions. I know how hard they were. Um, uh, but I also think that once they finally got the response right, uh, I'm, I'm impressed with it. Do you know how many people that the Bush administration put on the sanctions list after Russia invaded Georgia? Zero, zero. Do you know how many lethal weapons were sent to Georgia? Okay, you, you get the point, right? Uh, I think the response, and here I would say the Obama-Merkel response, because it wasn't just Obama, but sanctions, increased assistance for Ukraine, I would have gone further, as I said in print at the time. I would have uh, advocated for lethal assistance back then. But support for Ukraine and then strengthening NATO, that was the right response. What I worry, and so I would just stay that course. Uh, what I worry about is disinterest, both in my country and in Europe. Uh, so the, the most important thing I would do, I would appoint a special envoy for Ukraine, and I would make them travel to Rome. Uh, I would make them travel throughout Europe to uh, stay the course. I worry that Putin is winning that battle inside Europe, both within the alliance, because certain countries are less enthusiastic about uh, uh, the, the course with respect to Ukraine, but also within alliance countries, right? The, the war that he is waging uh, sometimes is, is producing successes. We need to be united, I think, in staying the course. Okay, how about in the front here? My name is Taras Shevchenko. I'm now World Fellow at Yale University. <laughs> I've been alumni. I didn't see you until just now. <laughs> I can't see you because of the light, but good to see you. I've been alumni of Stanford Summer Program exactly 10 years ago, 2007, when Admaster McFall was director of, of this center. And uh, I'd like to ask you, you Which mentioned is better, that Stanford or Yale? <laughs> We're on the record. Um, There's only one answer. No, I just kidding. I think it's also can be viewed at Yale. You understand me? <laughs> so my question is about democracy. You mentioned that one thing that is important for Ukraine is to strengthen democracy. What are possible scenarios of strengthening and developing democracy in Ukraine you see, and what are drivers that this or that scenario can work? Is it like just small improvements or more or less remaining what Ukraine is already doing or some big steps? There are, of course, many risks, but what are possible optimistic scenarios of strength in democracy? Well, I think we should ask Dr. Fukuyama that question. That's for both of you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so we've been, so all of the um, 
Ukrainian emerging leaders, fellows this year, and Slava are all in my class. And so we all walk back from the class talking about precisely these issues. Uh, you know, one thing I've been arguing for some time is that the problem in Ukraine is really not democracy. If by democracy you mean elections, popular choice, you know, having people out there campaigning, what's, what's missing uh, is really a modern state, uh, a state that can actually deliver services uh, and also a rule of law that is really constraining on not just ordinary people but, you know, powerful people as well. Uh, and those are much harder, you know, to get to than, than democracy. Uh, and in fact, in many countries in the world, it's actually the democracy that has undermined both the quality state and the rule of law. So, you know, I'm sure that um, Yulia Timoshenko, you know, is not going to be good for any of those, you know, other institutions, although she could get, you know, elected in a, you know, in a, in a popular uh, ballot. So, I think that that's really what's important. You have to have a capable government that is run by people who are not corrupt, that have the kind of professional background and expertise uh, and the organizational skills to actually deliver health, education, economic development. You know, these are the things ultimately that people want out of a government. Uh, it's very nice to be able to vote you know, for people, but in the end, if you're not delivering those kinds of services, people aren't going to vote for you anymore. And in fact, they may decide that democracy isn't such a great thing uh, after all. So I think that would be, you know, that would be my focus. Just to echo that, I mean, I, I, I agree with Frank. I think, it, I think in terms of social science, these are really hard social science questions. Where does that come from, right? That's, in some ways, that's the fundamental question, the question that his course is wrestling with. Let me say anecdotally, something that, that echoes that, but is, is based just on my travels back and forth to Ukraine. I was there last month, I think, the last time. What's striking about Ukrainian society for somebody uh, who kind of comes in and out and used to come in and out of Russia and travels in the region quite a bit and has studied these questions for a long time um, is um, social capital seems a much richer in, so I'm using a giant, stupid political science term, social capital. I mean like the, this front row right here, right? That, that's what I mean. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, the generational thing you talked about, that, that you, you feel there is a, a vibrant society. Uh, it's a younger society. Uh, and, and some of those younger people want to invest in exactly what Frank was talking about, including people that are sitting right here. Uh, that's, a, that's a sign of optimism to me, right? Because working in the bureaucracy, that's, that's, not, that's not as fun as being on, the, on Maidan. Uh, that, 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 the, 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 the slogging away of building a modern state. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Uh, there aren't those breakthrough moments. Um, uh, and yet, I, I see it you know, anecdotally and I see people talking about it as something important to do. That's something I don't see in other societies that are not as far along, and that makes me very optimistic. Okay. Yes, how about? Mikita Safranenko, Ukrainian American Coordinating Council. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, team of CDDRL team and uh, Professor Fukuyama, Professor McFall, and uh, you have other professors who are in charge of this program, beautiful program. We really appreciate it, and it's really important for Ukraine. And uh, I have a question uh, more from community. So as a local community, Ukrainian community in California, based on uh, uh, Department of State, it's more than 100,000 Ukrainians living in California. And in these um, terms, how local Ukrainians uh, can help uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, economic situation of Ukraine based here, because we are here, and how, how like, wh what is your idea as how we can uh, make jobs in Ukraine from here, or what is like roadmap? Uh, I'm sure all of you have uh, some thoughts to share. Thank you. Lena, this is a question for you. <laughs> yeah. um, we actually, we had the, the first, um, the first economic conference in August, and that was that was 
during the Ukrainian World Congress in Ukraine. And we set out a seven-point roadmap, which is going to be distributed and, and will be uh, communicated throughout all the communities during the next three to six months. Um, but basically, it's a seven-point plan. And first and foremost, it is to, to promote exports of Ukrainian goods and services. That's very important. I mean, with especially with the DCFTA and especially with Ukrainians in Europe. I mean, when we look at, you know, pre implementation of DCFTA, you had a 23% drop in exports to EU. Now it's it's a over 30% year on year increase. So we do see that momentum and we do see that kind of that by Ukrainian um, momentum throughout the communities is also very important. So that's first and foremost. Uh, second is foreign direct investment. I mean, clearly with Ukrainian GDP, the real GDP dropping in half um, and hovering around $100 billion. The country needs foreign direct investment. And that's where also communities can, can play a role. I mean, I'm from Ukrainian-Canadian community, I've, though I've lived in Ukraine for 25, 24 years. Um, but, you know, we do have Ukrainians who have invested in Ukraine who are now looking at coming back because they invested in the 90s, had a bad experience, and everybody, the 1.4 million Canadians know about their experience. Um, so they're now starting to return, and we're encouraging different you know, groups uh, throughout the world, especially the opinion leaders within the communities, to, to give the new generation a chance. And where they are investing is IT in light manufacturing, in <coughs> higher you know, value-added you know, value food processing, um, in the film industry. I mean, so they, they are, they're these very interesting new sectors of the economy. Um, third, I mean, in addition to those, um, we are starting, we, d we did agree with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also Ministry of Economy on honorary trade consuls. And uh, this is very important, mm -hmm. honorary consuls, which, um, which would have the diplomatic status. We are rolling out a three country pilot program starting in Canada. So Canada will have the first, um, where the diaspora, the community is suggesting to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who to appoint as honorary consuls in these countries from the communities um, who have been vetted, who can also be you know, an extension of, of Ukraine's policy in those countries. Um, in addition, we're reaching out to the communities throughout the world to find CEOs for state-owned enterprises. I mean, everybody knows we're going through the state-owned enterprise reform, and we have had a spotty record in terms of getting the word out that those positions are available and the tender process. So, you know, there's, what, 3,000 state-owned enterprises. There's about 100 that are, that are really key and strategic. And as those are reopened, there will be an appeal made directly to the communities around the world because these are great positions. I mean, they are, they are, they are positions that are, you know, market, uh, market paid, market pay. And, the, you know, Ukrainians in America and Canada Australia, throughout the world, they don't even know about these positions. And they, many of them would want to come and be part of this reform. I mean, so these are, this is just a few of the, of the, you know, the seven point plan. There's more, um, but I would, I would say stay tuned to Ukraine World Congress and this, uh, this new committee, because this is, this is a, a new effort. We have never been involved in, in, in the economy in Ukraine. You know, so getting involved in this way and mobilizing the, the community in this way is something new and something that we'll see rolled out over the coming year. We're at the end of our time, but we had another question over on this side. Well, actually, all right, so we have two. So why don't you both ask your questions and then... Yeah. It's we'll good. Uh, I am Fedor Alexandrovich. I am a Ukrainian artist, have post-tomorrow big exhibition in San Francisco about Golodomor opening in uh, Life Warps Gallery. Uh, but my question is, uh, how do you think uh, uh, one time, one life, Russia uh, apologize for Ukraine, uh, for Golodomor, for Chernobyl, for genocide of Ukrainian people? Yeah, it's, uh, okay. is that correct? Uh, correct okay, and question. you want to ask your question also? But I think it's a very important question, actually, you know, about Holodomor and recognition of Holodomor and whether in our lifetime we will ever see that Russia will apologize to that. But my question is more economic because there was a lot of talk about economic reforms and how much has been accomplished. 
but and we all know it's not a secrecy for us, right? That the strong developed country is based on strong middle class. And behind middle class, you have small and medium business. That's the foundation, right? And we know that about the US, we know that about any developed country. And when I talk to my, this is what I see living here, but talking to my ex-classmates, you know, they, they complain to me, they say, life is so hard, my wife is gonna go to Italy and she's gonna work, I'm gonna try my luck in Ireland. And I tell them, well, why don't you go start a business? Start a bakery, start a you know, repair shop, do a small business of your own. And the answer that I often get it's so hard. And maybe that's the perception. And what they talk about, they talk about red tape and the difficulty when you incorporate it, start a business and how difficult it is then to close it about the attention of different enforcement agencies. And uh, you know, and again, maybe that's the perception that carries forward from prior times when it was really hard to start a business. But maybe you can address that because that seems to be the crux, right? If you can change their perception, if you can get people to start their own businesses, because Ukrainians are incredibly entrepreneurial, right? When, especially when they come to this country, many of them start their businesses. But because of this perception, you know, many don't even venture out, they don't even want to try. So maybe you can talk about that. What was recently done specifically in that aspect? Okay. Thank you for your question. I, I, I want to show you what my take. I think this uh, most problem now for doing business in Ukraine, you're right, this is some uh, previous regulation, but we are making significant steps. This year we are in the index of doing business, we are going in the three, third position, Kaya. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can open business one day. It was last year, it was three days. But without privatization of land, I mean agricultural land, uh, privatization of agricultural land for the small businesses, for small agricultural businesses, middle agricultural businesses, it would be a significant step. But uh, politicians uh, not support that because it's unpopular things among the people. So we need to share more information about it. And the businesses, I can agree with you, it's not easy to not open business, it's easy to open business, but survive with your small or medium business in Ukraine. But uh, some Polish, uh, Slovak comes to Ukraine, Moldovans, and doing very good business. Now, in my native city, Vinica, uh, former mayor of Vinica, now Prime Minister Groisman, create new conditions doing business. And President Poroshenko also politically, his, his district, political district. So uh, we understand how doing business. And by the way, your question about what can you do? Now we have undervalued assets. If you are, have enough money, I believe you have more than we have met two years ago. <laughs> the, uh, you can, he has a lot more you, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you try, try to, maybe to small business in Ukraine, because it's a te theoretical discussion about business. Please, create the team, come to Ukraine, and I personally will support you, believe me. <laughs> And we will do a good business in Ukraine. Not, not me. No, I'm ambassador. But I support, <laughs> I support you just create conditions for your business in Ukraine. Because we can discuss it many times. But just try. Just try and do it the same that you are successfully doing here. I'm not sure 100% that you will be the same success as you have here. But, you know, it's a potential the right time to come to Ukraine. Uh, next year... More next year's is the best best time to come. I know. <clears throat> yeah, if I can if I can add, you know, you hear so much about about this, my friend said, or 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 these kinds of comments, and and I I have to say, um, my advice is, you know, stop complaining and and do something and start something. And in terms of entrepreneurship, I mean, I have the I have the really the benefit of working with some of the most visionary entrepreneurs in the country. You know, people who started the Amazon of Ukraine, you know, Rosatka. I mean, nobody, no, you know, eight, eight years of, of hard work, of day in, day out hard work, and he's got the number one company in terms of e-commerce in the country. And so, I mean, look, understandably, in Ukraine, we don't have a culture of, of business. I mean, it, it's very much, 
almost looked down upon. You know, speculation, speculators, middlemen, that kind of thing. It's not, it's not revered. It's not applauded. It isn't something that you can really be proud of still today. That's changing with the new generation, but definitely with the older generation. I mean, you, you could get a PhD in vodka, but in terms of in term, in vodka making, but in terms, of, um, in terms of doing business, I mean, that wasn't a profession that anybody wanted their children to, to, to be in or to be proud of. Um, now, I mean, you know, so many, I, I, I see the names, the faces of, of so many entrepreneurs who, you know, it, last three deals we did, almost $20 million, two IT companies and a light manufacturing play. 28 years old, 30 years old, 32 years old. Running companies that employ 500 to 1,000 people. You know, growing their businesses from $40 million to $70 million in one year. I mean, these are, these are, these are people who, 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 who don't listen to kind of the talk around the kitchen about can't be done, regulations. I mean, it takes two days to open a business now. If you have a problem with enforcement agencies, take a picture on Facebook, upload it, you will not have a problem. You know, you have a country where the, the system fears the people. I mean, it used to be the people feared the system. That's gone. The, the system fears the people. And people have multiple, whether it's business ombudsmen or to Ukraine Invest or, you know, di to go to AmCham if you've got a problem. And if not, you upload it on social media and say, this is a person trying to shake me down. And guess what? You know, <laughs> within 24 hours, you know, you, you will no longer have that problem and that person will have that problem. So I, I, I think that there is no reason why you can't start a business in Ukraine today. We see it all the time. We back it. And, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a phenomenon that changing kind of the, the, the thoughts around it. But, but truly, that is the future for Ukraine. 11% of the economy is SMEs. I come from Canada. It should be 90%, right? So, I, I mean, that, that, is, that is where every, you know, people want to contribute to the country, start a business, employ people, create jobs. That's really important. Okay. Well, we're actually past our. And oh, you want to say the we, whole lot more? We have to yeah, respond okay. to this question. I tried to make it shorter. It's a very important issue. Thank you so much that you make this exhibition. Uh, was it important because we opened new documents last years, and we all understand that whole uh, lot in Ukraine, it is was criminal case, genocide against Ukrainians. Why we are not was not familiar with that? Because we do not did not have the this uh, documents about instruction. This goes from the Stalin and this Politburo leadership against Ukrainians. It was closed. Now it's open. And what has happened? Because famine was in Russia also, in Kuban, in these territories. When I told this Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, my counterpart, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia. You should also to name this famine in Russia. And he agreed. And they made the publication, three books about famine in Russia. When, and after that, something happened. I don't know, you know better what's happened. But they closed this project in the uh, Institute of Strategic Studies mm -hmm. and uh, take absolutely another narrative. So we now uh, work hard. I mean, uh, all of us and world, uh, Ukrainian World Congress and uh, embassy and Ukrainian president just push the countries to recognize Golodomor's genocide. This recognition now comes from 14 countries in the world. But in the United States, it's very important. And now we have nine states that recognize Golodomor's genocide. I signed with the head of the uh, committee of the Holodomor victims of the United States letter to the governors. I met with Governor Brown three times. Unfortunately, he's not yet made the proclamation, but I appreciate this California state uh, recognize importance of these days, Holodomor, but we count on your support, just recognize a genocide in assembly. And uh, we go further. Next year, we will now a resolution by Ukrainian caucus in a Congress, and we will believe this will be a decision in a Congress next uh, year. Uh, we count on that position of the United States because it's also support our support in hybrid wars 
not with Russia, not with Putin, but with everybody who is uh, violate, violating human rights. Uh, what will do in Russians? I think this uh, made this final decision. Now, this leadership, this regime, it's a completely different approach. They commented that last week, when we are make active steps here in the United States, Zakharov, Zah or I don't remember it, the name. Uh, the Maria. Uh, yes, you know her. Yeah. Uh, you know everybody in Russia. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, she commented that says you should not politicize this issue. <coughs> no, sorry. You killed some million people, not you, but you are take uh, the crimes of Stalin regime as own legacy. It's a wrong position. And uh, that's absolutely wrong position. That's why I believe we will have this political decision in the United States and all around the world about recognition of Holodomor in Ukraine, 1932-33 as genocide. And we will help Russia make the steps, also steps of recognition of the feminine Russia in that time and the crimes of the dictatorship regime of Stalin. Why, when has happened? Not sure this happened during the uh, Putin's president in the presidential position. But in the future, possible, it's possible. Well, 